Hello, BookTube. It's mid-October right now, which means that, believe it or not, the month of November is just a sneeze away. It will be barely any time, and then it will be here. And of course, November is host to a large number of BookTube events, the most famous of which is Nonfiction November. But there's another BookTube event, a scrappy newcomer now entering into its second year that's also coming up in November, New Worlds November, created by the Bookish Bryants and designed to celebrate science fiction. And once again, we are concentrating on shorter science fiction, 250 pages or fewer, and also short stories. Definitely want to bring to the fore short stories. The, the literary form that I believe science fiction was born from. And once again, the Bookish Bryants have assembled a great cast of hosts, a great enormous cast that I will leave linked down below. Uh, let me give you them just anyway, though. Of course, there's our hosts, and there's me. I'm one of the hosts. Some of these channels I know really well. Some of them I've done many events with. Others of them are new to me. I'll be exploring their back canon and, uh, and subscribing to them and figuring out what it is they like, what they can teach me. So we have uh, Sean D. Stanfast. We have Michael K. Vaughn. We have The Book Eclectic. We have Another Bibliophile Reads. We have Jim Reads Too Slow. Book Time with Elvis. Unlimited Reads, Science Fiction Reads, The Rambling Reviewer, and Read by Fred. So that's, that's you know, almost, that's ten uh, channels, and I know half of them well, and the other half, I, it's going to be a learning experience for me to see what kinds of things they read. I know, of the hosts that I know, I know there are some who've read an enormous amount of science fiction, the same as I have, I have read an enormous amount of science fiction in my life. But these newcomers add, it's wonderful that we're adding them on. And uh, this year, just like last year, we have weekly themes. Week one, if you want to follow it, is terrestrial. Uh, find a work that, of science fiction that takes place on Earth. Then week two is extraterrestrial. Uh, find a work that takes place off Earth. Here, I would, I would say, if you really want to follow the theme, find a science fiction work that never even mentions Earth. Then uh, week number three, read a work of classic science fiction. And this is something published before 1965, before New Wave really, really took off. And week number four is robots or AI, uh, kind of a favorite held over from last year. And once again, I want to stress, these are just themes. These are just prompts to help you give shape to uh, a, an event. You don't have to. If you read some science fiction in November uh, and use the hashtag nonfiction, uh, New World's November, then you're on board. <laughs> especially if you don't read that much science fiction and maybe have wanted to read more. And especially also if you have read science fiction, but you have scanted short stories. Science fiction short stories are much shorter works. There's a wealth of short stories out there and more all the time in a, in a hundred different venues. But this year, in addition to the themes, there are also sub-themes that act as, uh, Becky at the Bookish Brian's put it, as a kind of scavenger hunt. To find as many of these as you can while you are going through the main themes for the month. And these sub-themes are pretty much every MacGuffin that you could think of in a science fiction story. There's alien archaeology, alien romance, a translated work, alternate worlds or dimensions, the far future, so not your grandchildren. We're talking about our present era being a distant memory. Uh, war or the military, a whole, whole subgenre of science fiction is military science fiction. Genre crossing, where you add in something else. Those of you who are fans of, for instance, science fiction romance. <laughs> uh, first contact, time travel, invasions, humorous, political, and libraries. And the extra credit on top of all this, see, these are all just sort of mobile things for you to play with during the course of the month. To combine them or don't in any way that you like. But the extra credit is uh, an alternate a parallel universe where you encounter a science fiction work in one media form and then watch or read that same science fiction creation adapted for a different media form. The typical sequence here would be that you read a short story or a novel and then watch its adaptation, watch some adaptation by it. I think that I will be doing that. I think that's probably the push that I need to watch some of the uh, the video productions that I have backlogged enormously. I think that'll be, that'll be the way to do it. In fact, there are a couple of 
of things that I really want to watch uh, that are somewhat neglected. Fan movies, fan creations on YouTube that are done on a shoestring budget by dedicated people who don't have any rights to the material. I'll be looking all around for stuff like this, but there may also be some some far more better known and more financed things. Like, for instance, reading a Star Trek novel of a movie is always fascinating. I actually haven't done that in a long, long time. When I realized that Star Trek VI was going to be the last Star Trek movie featuring my crew, I went and did that. I read the novel and the movie I paired them up for every one of those movies. And it was interesting. It was really, really interesting, especially since a lot of the Vonda McIntyre novels dramatized scenes that were in the original script but never filmed, or where the film the film version, the, the scenes were filmed, and no one can seem to find them. They don't even show up in renegade cuts at Comic-Con, at Star Trek conventions. That was a lot of fun. I don't know that I'll do that again, but I'll do something. <laughs> uh and I, it, uh, by way of a TBR, of course, I'll be reading lots and lots of science fiction in November. And I may, depending on whether or not I can get my head out of my asteroid, <laughs> I may be writing science fiction for NaNoWriMo, which is another huge event that takes place in November, but is not specifically a booktube event. National Novel Writing Month is in November. But one of the things that I will certainly be reading in November and that I would be reading, even if nonfiction or New World's November were still just a twinkle in the bookish Bryant's eyes, would be science fiction new releases, which I read anyway. I, I read the new releases, as many as I can, in all of the genres that interest me in the American book market every year. Science fiction and fantasy are definitely among those categories. So I thought we'd go through what's coming up in November. I don't think I've read any of these. so But it'll give you an idea of at least some of what I'll be reading. Of course, I will do a lot of looking around online ebooks charity shops used bookstores i'll be good i'll be doing a lot of science fiction buying and impulse reading but these things will definitely be there like for instance uh, an ongoing series the best american series there's a best american science fiction and fantasy for 2022 there's best american volume for almost everything that you can think of certainly all the genres that i love this will introduce me i am sure to a whole bunch of authors that I've never heard of it before, especially since most of these annual anthologies now religiously avoid any science fiction periodical that has e that employs even one cis het white man. So the major science fiction anthologies, the magazine of science fiction and fantasy, Asimov's and Analog, who do still employ some, at least one, cis het white men, usually the editors of these series won't even consider the science fiction that appears in an entire year of those publications. Instead, they will go elsewhere. Uh, that's, of course, stupid and fascist, but it also means that the, the end result table of contents in these anthologies that are by no means the year's best because they're avoiding the best, uh, it, it means that the table of contents in these things that used to be the best, best American, year's best, all that sort of thing, will be scouring publications that I know very little about which may turn up a whole bunch of stories that I really like. Uh, so I'll definitely be looking at that. Every year I do that. Then we have, the, uh, this is by Shauna Lawless. This is The Children of Gods and Fighting Men. I believe I've heard about this on the Brothers Gwyn channel, but I think, so I think it was probably out in the UK first. It's a, an epic fantasy, a supernatural epic fantasy uh, based on Irish mythology. The, on the, the two warring groups of supernatural beings in most Irish mythology. It could be really good. I will have to see. I'm, I'm totally uh, un unfamiliar with this author. Then this next one is by Nathan Tavares. This is Fractured Infinity, where uh, the plot line is a, a scientist who is called in to consult on an, on an alternate reality program and starts to fall in love with one, uh, with the scientist, one of the scientists who is involved in that program, and that raises when you have two people creating a relationship in a multiverse story, that immediately raises the que all sorts of questions about who they are in other universes. I, I don't know this author as far as I know, so I'll definitely give this a try. This next one is uh, the second book in a series. I believe I read the first one. This is Gates of Hope by Rick Partlow. The premise of which, or one part of the premise of which, is that interstellar gates 
traveling uh, gates are opening up, and there's a very hostile race at the, on the other side of those gates. Sort of interstellar gates, like Stargate or whatnot, are, are uh, familiar science fiction workarounds to Einsteinian relativ relativistics, to the, the speed limit of the speed of light, that sort of makes, if you're not going to create faster than life travel, you pretty much need gates of some kind or other, uh, largely inspired by... Uh, quantum entanglement, which on one level read very much for amateurs reads like a, like a, a transportation gate of some kind, because information is traveling between two particles without transversing the distance in between. The better understanding of quantum entanglement, as far as I understand it, is that those two particles are part of the same field. They're part of the same quantum field. So you're not transmitting information between the two of them instantaneously. Instead, you're changing the field, and they're both part of it wherever they are. And other things in, in between them or all around them are not part of that, that quantum field. They're part of other quantum fields, which, if true, would ruin the idea of Gates. But this, this is military science fiction. It's not really concerned with the science. It's much more concerned with the shoot-em-ups, I would imagine. If I remember the first book, that, that was largely true. And it was, if I remember correctly, fairly good. Then this next one, not going to have to worry about this one being fairly good, but it's a big new release, so I will definitely read it. This is Brian Herbert and Kevin J. Anderson. This is the latest in their Dune pastiche fiction. This is Heir of Caladan. I believe this is the third book in a series about young Paul Atreides before he goes to Dune, when he's still on the lush jungle world of his home. So you have snakes there that I assume are native to Caladan, but that are meant to foreshadow the sandworms of dune i read the first two books in this series i'm pretty sure from if i remember those first two books correctly they are setting up for a concluding volume where the end of air of caladan will be the, the the trip to dune i i could be wrong about that this might be just part of an interminable series i i don't like any of these of these dune pastiche novels not just because they shouldn't exist this is a weird way for Brian for uh, Brian Herbert to honor the literary legacy of his father. They shouldn't exist, but that's not the main reason that that I haven't liked any of them. The main reason I haven't liked any of them is because they're very boring. They don't read at all. Like they have none of the the linguistic virtuosity of Frank Herbert. Instead, they just sort of plod, and that that feels like a desecration. But well, I'll give it a try anyway. Then this next one is by Rob Brownwell, Brownwell Brownell, Rob Brownell. And it is inv in invention. Okay, this next one is by Rob Brownell, and it is called inv "Invention Is a Mother," and it the the description of it is really madcap. So this is not, the, the huge majority of science fiction releases that are coming out in November are part 17 in, in an ongoing series, part 23 in an ongoing series, part 4, part 5, part 10, part 11, where at that point, you know, past, past part 3 in a series, it's all uh, plot titillation. It's, it's all for the faithful. It's, there's no way that you can join a series on part 11. And make any sense of it at all. So the fact that this is a standalone novel, especially by an author I don't know and have never read, makes it really, really enticing. We will we will see if uh, it looks like it's going to be uh, partly funny and attempt at humor. That also is very rare. Science fiction has become a murderously solemn genre. Uh, this next one is by Everina Maxwell, and this is Ocean's Echo, which is the next book from the author of Winter's Orbit which was a very touching science fiction story in which the science fiction was virtually perfunctory. It was mainly just a YA love story. I'm imagining, since Winter's Orbit did fairly well, I'm imagining that Ocean's Echo will be the same thing. A largely a YA love story with a few trappings of science fiction. This one about two young people who can affect minds. One can sort of read thoughts and the other can, can persuade, can push thoughts. And they have to pretend to have some sort of union for the sake of a gimmick, a plot, and as is, you know, the standard the standard idea in 
fake romance plots like this is that the the fake romance becomes real. We'll see. I don't I don't care at all, nor do I hold it against this book in any way. If some of the plot elements are predictable, that is endemic to both YA and romance. So a YA romance is, is there's no chance that it will avoid them. I'll be I'll be mainly caring about how well it was done, and Winter's Orbit was done well. So I and also I get the impression from what little I've read about this, that it is not actually a sequel. That it takes place in the same imagined universe, but that it's a standalone book. That would be, like I say, very, very refreshing. Then this next one is a standalone book. It is also a classic. It will be, uh, it's one of the only things on this list that I've actually read. But there's a new edition coming out. I'll be looking forward to that to give it a reread, my first reread in decades. <laughs> this is Snow Crash by Neil Stevenson. His big proto- uh, cyberpunk novel that is totally immersive just wonderfully pinchonianly immersive i haven't read it in so long that i'm sure there are nuances cre creativity in here that i just missed completely the first time i'm sure there is i read this as a little brown mass market paperback a long long time ago so it's well well and truly past time that i read it again and uh, there's always like i say all the time about my uh my profession there's always a reprint of something that's of interest. The, the reprint culture, I think, is still fairly anemic in the United States, especially in science fiction, but even so, even though it's anemic, every season, every month, brings at least two or three reprints, new editions, new translations of older works, all that sort of thing, that are very, very interesting. That They, would, they definitely scratch the itch for me of revisiting older works. Then uh, the next one that we have here is, I believe, self-published. I could be wrong about that. This is, P the author is Peter Codron, and the book is The Tempest, First Contact. So this will certainly be a first, the first contact uh, scavenger hunt. Uh, but this is a generation ship. This is a sleeper ship that is out in a long voyage from Earth to uh, an a, a habitable alien planet. There are thousands of, of colonists in suspended animation, and there's a crew that isn't in suspended animation when they encounter a massive storm. So it's possible that this is also uh, that this would also fulfill week two's prompt of extraterrestrial, where in in my reading of, of week two's prompt, none of the action takes place on Earth. Could be that this is as well. I don't know this author at all. I'm definitely willing to uh, to give the book a try. Then this, this next one, uh, the, I, as far as I know, if I remember correctly, there are no, there is no scavenger hunt for pastiche fiction. Probably just as well. It's a little bit rare, especially in science fiction that's that's come out by mainstream publishing. This next one is pastiche fiction, and I don't hold much hope for it, but I'll definitely give it a try. This is uh, by V. Castro, and it is Aliens Vasquez. This is the story of Private First Class ba Vasquez from the movie Aliens, who is introduced in that movie, makes an indelible impression in that movie, and dies in that movie. This is her backstory where she came from before she got into the uh, the colonial marines, before she got to Hadley's Hope, before anything like that happened. What what was she doing? What is her story up until then? I, I don't know what to expect from this book. I don't think I've ever read this author, although I think this author is fairly well known in science fiction circles. I don't know what to expect from this book because, of course, <laughs> Vasquez didn't go on from her origin story to become a middle manager at an Arby's. <laughs> she went on from her origin story to have a pivotal role in one of the greatest science fiction shoot 'em up movies of all time. A movie that I love, love dearly. <laughs> if there are, what I'm trying to say is, if there are xenomorphs in your future and your novel stops before them, <laughs> how is it not going to feel anticlimactic? How is that possible? How is this going to be narratively satisfying if that's what happens. Now, I'm assuming that that's not what happens. I'm not trying to look over V. Castor's shoulder, but I'm assuming what she's done here, that we will get all of Vasquez at Hadley's Hope, that we will get all of Vasquez, of her, of Vasquez's parts in Aliens. I'm sure, I'm assuming that's what we'll get, that this is not, in fact, a book without Aliens. <laughs> we shall see. We shall see. Uh, this next one is Chuck Wendig. This is Wayward, which is his, uh, Big, his sequel to his enormous book, Wayfarers. A, a, a strange book. I didn't quite know what to make of it. I liked it a lot. About a weird 
end of the world scenario, very strange end of the world scenario where people start sort of sleepwalking to Shangri-La while the world goes to hell all around them. And the, since they're defenseless, they don't know where they're going. Their loved ones follow along with them to sort of shepherd them on the way. And they eventually get somewhere. They eventually get where they were going for some God unknown reason. It's in Colorado. And they, this book takes off from there where the world is considering, is continuing to spiral downward. But a community has formed, a kind of protected community has formed, but there are negative forces all around it. Chuck Wendig is uh, a bit of a spaz, but it works in his fiction. <laughs> it might not work on his social media, but it works in his fiction, generally speaking. The, the first book had indulgences that I would have pruned had I been his editor. I have no idea what he's like to edit. The... I came eventually to feel a bit of affection for them. I came eventually to expect them. I imagine they'll be in this book too, but I, I know I know that I've been sort of ragging during this video on uh, science fiction's compulsion towards endless multi-part sagas that don't wrap up. Wayfarers should have been a standalone novel, but it was an inviting enough world and an inviting enough writer so that. I'll definitely take a sequel, certainly. Uh, and then we'll finish up with another end of the world, another dystopia thing. This is, I think, uh, a second part again. This is by Connor Strong, and it is World of Terror. I think I read the first book in this series. I believe this is book number two of, uh, of the United States post-EMP, electromagnetic pulse, <laughs> post that. Electromagnetic pulse, for those of you who maybe don't keep up on your apocalyptic... Uh, inevitabilities i should point out it's an it's an absolute inevitability that something causes an electromagnetic pulse an emp that something is almost certainly going to be a solar flare it doesn't have to be from our sun it could be from another sun but if if a, a soul a big coronal ejection from a nearby star sweeps through this solar system it would it would have relatively the same effect as as an emp launched from or caused by a coronal ejection of earth's sun earth's sun is constantly flashing off uh, gigantic blasts of superheated plasma. Gigantic blasts. I mean, ten times the size of Jupiter. And it's constantly doing that. That's not a one-off thing. That happens all the time. The only reason that Earth has not been hit by one of them, of a major kind, there was one just, just a century ago that was pretty severe, would have ruined our society today if our society today had existed back then. The only reason that we haven't had a, really one of those to make headlines is because Earth is so small, it, just so tiny. I mean, if you had a beach ball and it was firing off little jets of water from its surface, if if a football field away, you had a grain of sand. Well, you're not, you know, if, if you're just looking at the beach ball and it's firing off these jets of water, you're going to think, well, anything nearby is going to get blasted eventually, sooner rather than later. But if I then show you a grain of sand a football field away, you're going to think, okay, probably not then. And that's the circumstance. That's the only reason that Earth hasn't been hit. Earth has a very strong electromagnetic field. It has, it has natural defenses against such a thing, but such a thing would still fry every satellite in orbit. It would still reduce electrical grids all over the planet to useless hunks of metal. They would have to be rebuilt. It wouldn't be a question of sending in, you know, the Con Ed engineers in their bib overalls to fix something overnight. It'd be down for a year. The world would be reduced to the late Middle Ages for at least a year. That is certainly going to happen. The, the world, the human world that has existed before the 20th century only had to worry about skin cancer, that sort of thing, radiated food stocks. Now, we have built our entire world around the, the technology that is afforded to us by a gigantic network of orbiting satellites, by gigantic uh, pastures of transformer fields, all of the uh, server farms for all of the internet, all of that stuff would be fried by an EMP. And in this world, that has happened. And our characters just have to deal with it. They just have to figure out what's going on. And as usual in an EMP novel of some kind, like, for instance, Dies the Fire by S.M. Sterling, and I'm always recommending to you, the EMP always catches people by surprise. <laughs> and so part of the story, I believe, if I remember correctly, if I'm remembering the right series, part, a large part of the first book in the series was that, was not so much the EMP itself and the world that it then creates, but rather surviving the initial moments of losing all 
all technological power. It's in those moments, EMP novels, natural disaster novels of one kind or another, th it's, those moments are when the author very wisely uses those adverse circumstances to draw their characters for you so that you know who takes easy, easy outs, who victimizes other people, who's creative in a pinch, that sort of thing. And this, that is true in this book. So I don't know how much of that will be over for Volume 2, for World of Terror, but I'm up for it. I love books like this, especially... Uh, I'm not a big fan of info dumping, of course. It can, there are grateful, graceful ways to do it. People, authors who write EMP-style dystopias, uh, where it's not nuclear, where everybody's going to live, and where you're seeing the change happen. So not plunking you down in the dystopia years later, but letting you see the actual change from a world with light switches that work to a world with light switches that don't. Usually when authors write that kind of thing, they've done a huge amount of research, and it tends to show in all the best ways. So <laughs> I'm, I'm all for it, all, all for it. And those are... That's a, a sampling of what I will be reading in November, New World's November or not. <laughs> but because it's New World's November, I will be devoting a larger chunk of my reading time to science fiction than I usually do. I'll be more receptive to it, let's just say, at charity bookshops or at the Brattle Bookshop. I'll be more receptive to ebooks of the same that I happen to come across or self published stuff. Uh, there's a ton of it for science fiction, a ton of it, usually free. Oh, very reasonably priced. And those authors, of course, you know, if, if you're self-publishing book one in a science fiction series, that you're doing it yourself. You hired an editor with money you, don't, you can't afford. You hired an artist for your cover with money you can't really afford. It's a dream for you to publish a book, and you charge $2 for it. That's not a source of disdain. That money means a lot more to that author than $20 means to... Brandon Sanderson. So I'll be looking for a lot of those as well, and if I find any real gems, I'll be sure to sing them out. But that is the beginning, anyway. That's the beginning shape of my New World's November, is the, some of the new releases in science fiction that are coming out in the month of November. But I'll also be doing a lot of other things here to try and get as many of these scavenger hunts as I can. So that's New World's November. I hope that you will join us. I am one of the hosts. I don't know if I said that, but I, I am one of the hosts. I will be making plentiful New, New World's November videos throughout the month. And I will leave a list to all of my co-hosts down below, all of whom deserve a subscription from you so that you don't miss their videos either. Uh, some of them, like I said, I know quite well and can strongly recommend. Others I will be learning. So that is New World's November for this month. Very happy to see it return. Uh, I'm going to wrap this up for now, uh, but I'll be back. Thank you, BookTube.